And over here, notice case number two is now available. It's the stock and bond valuation. So here's a description of it. Here's a folder for you to submit. Due date, April 14th, midnight. That's a Friday. You also have, will have a discussion due that day. So uh, you need to <coughs> uh, time it. This, this stock and bond valuation really doesn't take that long uh, once you understand it. But uh, the instructions... Instructions. So in this case, you're going to be uh, uh, <clears throat> working with the knowledge that we got from Chapter 7, Chapter 10. I'm sorry, Chapter 9. Chapter 7 was bond valuation. Chapter 9 was stock valuation. Also, a little bit of Chapter 8 in there, the uh, estimating the required rate of return for equity uh, is, is part of this assignment. <clears throat> but uh, uh, you need to choose a company and I want to approve that company before you start working on it because I don't want you to get too far into this and realize that you chose a company you really shouldn't have chosen. So I want to protect you from yourselves. So there's a reason that I want you to you know, you know, come up with a company. So <clears throat> company selection. Company selection, it should be a publicly traded company so you can find it in Yahoo or, or Morningstar. It should also pay dividends. So it should, it has to have a, a dividend payment uh, because we're, we're going to use that Gordon growth model or that constant growth model or some variation of it <coughs> to estimate a value. And I'm going to go through an example today uh, using Duke Energy. So it's got to pay dividends. And I would look at what's called the payout ratio. I'm going to show you what the payout ratio is today. If you can get a payout ratio that is between 0 and 1, or between 0 and 100%, your life is going to be so much easier. So I'll, I'll show you what to look for in that area. And then uh, uh, you, the, the company you choose also has to have publicly traded debt outstanding, because you're also going to have to do some analysis of the debt of the company. So it's got to have publicly traded debt outstanding that you can do that analysis. So I'll go through, I'll, I'll look at Duke Energy today and, and highlight the things you need to look for. And then you go choose a company that you want to analyze. If it's one of the companies you, you did in part one, that's fine. In case number one, that's fine. But if, if the companies you used in case number one don't fit the requirements, choose something else. Uh, Everything you need to do this assignment you can get from Yahoo Finance or and or Morningstar. So there's, you, you're not going to have to go to the library to search anything out here. Uh, you'll be able to get everything you need from, from online sources. So uh, please choose your company no later than March 28th. So start thinking about it now. So you'll have plenty of time, plenty of time to uh, uh, do your analysis. So the first part of the analysis is the stock valuation, and uh, you're going to value the stock using what's commonly called the Gordon uh, growth model, which is the constant dividend growth model. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this model here, and we're going to use it uh, for valuing Duke Energy here in a minute. So it should be clear what you're supposed to use. Uh, so identify all the variables that uh, <laughs> you used in your model and where you got this data. So uh, uh, identify your sources. And you'll, you'll need to use a capital asset pricing model. This came from Chapter 8 in your textbook. Things that you need, to, you, you need for the capital asset pricing model, you need a risk-free rate. And we'll go through an example of using the CAPM here in a couple minutes. So you'll need the risk-free rate. You'll need the market risk premium. And I'm giving these to you. The risk-free rate right now is about 2.4%. So just go ahead and use that. And I'm giving you a market risk premium, really estimating that market risk premium is beyond the, beyond the scope of this class. So I'm giving that to you. Uh, the market risk premium right now is probably about 5%. And when you take a beta out of something like 
uh, yahoo.fin or finance.yahoo.com or Morningstar, they need to be adjusted. I'm going to show you how to adjust the beta today. So pay attention when I do that because you'll need to adjust your beta. And then using the beta, the risk free rate, the market risk premium, you can estimate your required rate of return. Another thing you're going to have to do is estimate the growth, the growth in dividends. And I'm going to go through how to do that today. How you estimate the growth in dividends. It's, it's a very simple process. Basically, I'm going to explain that you just take the return on equity times the percentage of income which is retained and reinvested in the firm. So I'll go through an example of how to do that. And once you have all these pieces, you should be able to estimate an intrinsic value. Now, one of the reasons I said, <clears throat> try to choose a company that has a payout ratio somewhere between 0 and 100% is because if you have a payout ratio greater than 100%, your growth rate is likely to be higher than your required rate of return. And we know in this constant growth model, R has to be greater than G. And still it's possible that you're going to have a company which has R greater than G, in which case you're going to have to use the non-constant growth model uh, as there were some examples in, in the slides on Tuesday. And in, if you do the non-constant growth model, the best thing to do is, is use that super normal, that high growth rate for three years, and just assume that dividends are going to grow at some you know, constant rate in the long term. Uh, analysts typically assume that that constant rate will be somewhere around the growth rate in GDP. Uh, and you can read that in this, this uh, paragraph. And the growth rate in GDP right now is about uh, 3%. But anyway, so those are things for you to consider. Hopefully you won't have to do a uh, non-constant growth model. So you uh, calculate your intrinsic value, compare that to the recent stock market price. We're going to see, you know, the air. I, I just picked Duke out of the air today. I had no, no pre preconceived notions about it, but... Uh, utilities are typically fairly stable in their dividend payment streams. Uh, people buy utilities for their dividend streams, so a dividend discount model works very well in utilities. Uh, but, and we're going to see that the estimated intrinsic value we come up with today, with today is very close to what the market price is. So you want to compare your intrinsic value to the market price and analyze why you have any differences. And it, a lot of it could be based on assumptions. So anyway, second part is on bond valuation. So find one bond issue for your company. And typically, a publicly traded firm with bonds outstanding will have a lot of bond issues or multiple bond issues. So either choose the largest or the most recently issued. <coughs> uh, stay away from callable bonds if you can. Stay away from convertible bonds. I will. When you submit your company, I will make a suggestion of what bonds you actually use to make it easier for you. So uh, choose your company soon so I have time to look at that stuff. And so for the bond, you need to calculate the, the, uh, the current price, the current yield, yield to maturity. And I want you to do these calculations on your, uh, on your uh, calculator and just compare those to what is reported in Morningstar, uh, where you're getting this bond data. And, and think about what differences there may be. So, uh, so your results may be slightly different. And, and then the last step is assume that there is a 2% increase in market interest rates a year from now. And uh, I want you to figure out, well, what's going to happen to the bond price? What's going to happen in the current yield? What's going to happen to yield to maturity uh, uh, for your bond uh, a year from now? And so you'll need to actually calculate the change in price resulting from this increase in, in interest rates. Okay, so that's an overview to kind of get you primed for what you need to do. Uh, look, at the, look at the material. Uh, shoot me an email with any questions you have to get started. Go out and find a company. So, with that being said, I'm going to pick up where I left off the other day, but I'm also going to, um, I've added a couple slides in here. 
Okay, so we, we covered the constant growth dividend discount model, and this is also called the Gordon growth model. Bless you. This is called the constant growth model or the Gordon growth model, whatever. But, but in this model, we're assuming that dividends grow at a constant rate G. And if we assume that dividends grow at a constant rate G, and so long as G is less than a required rate of return, we can estimate the value of the stock is just the most recent dividend times 1 plus G. And the most recent dividend, I can do it right here. The most recent dividend times 1 plus G gives us the dividend we expect in the next period divided by R sub S minus G. And remember here, R sub S has to be less than G. Up, up, up. That's, that's, correct me on that. R sub S has to be greater than G. G has to be less than R sub S. Yeah, that was a critical mistake. So R sub S has, has to be greater than the growth rate. So our required rate of return has to be greater than the growth rate. So we know where we can get this R sub S. We can get this R sub S from uh, cap M. So we can get this R sub S from cap M, which cap M said R sub S would be equal to R sub risk-free rate plus R beta times the risk premium on the market. So that's simple calculation. I've given you R sub F. I've given you the risk-free rate 2.4%. I've given you the risk premium on the market of 5%. All you have to do is find the beta. And so we'll go through an example on how to do that in a minute. Now, more challenging is this G right here. Where does this G come from? Where does this G come from? <clears throat> and so that's what we're going to talk about next. Estimating the dividend growth. So consider, consider a firm that pays all of its earnings out as dividends. So if a firm pays all of its earnings out in, in dividends, no earnings are reinvested in the firm. So the way that firms generate growth is they take some of their current earnings and they reinvest it, plow it back into the firm to generate growth. So if it doesn't pay anything, or if it doesn't retain anything in the firm, if it pays everything out in dividends, then earnings aren't going to grow. So a firm that has a 100% payout ratio paying everything out in dividends, then we don't expect that firm to grow. It, it, will, it will replace existing equipment as it wears out, but it's not going to invest in any new equipment. So it's not going to grow. <coughs> now let's consider another firm. This other firm doesn't pay any dividends. And I shouldn't say dividends will grow. <coughs> doesn't pay any dividends. So uh, consider a firm that pays no dividends. All earnings are reinvested in the firm. Well, then earnings will grow because we're putting all this, we're plowing all this, this, these earnings back into the firm and you know, buying new plant and equipment to expand. Our firm, the earnings will grow at the return on equity. So the return on equity is a good estimate of no, how earnings are going to grow for every dollar we reinvest in the firm. <clears throat> so the, the earnings and dividend growth rate is going to be a function of the return on equity, ROE, a function of proportion of, any, or of earnings that are retained in the firm called the plowback or retention ratio. And this plowback or retention ratio is just one minus the payout ratio. So we can, we can find the payout ratio. We're, we're going to see that in Yahoo.Finance for Duke Energy. It, it tells you what the payout ratio is. So if you know the payout ratio, just one minus that is what's retained in the firm, plowed back in the firm. So in fact, let me give you a formula here. Growth rate, we can estimate it as re return on equity, ROE, times the retention ratio. C 
So we estimate our growth rate as the return on equity times the retention ratio. And then we can use that, we can use that growth rate here in this constant growth dividend discount model so long as that growth rate is less than a required rate of return. So that's how we estimate the, the growth rate over here in the constant growth uh, dividend discount model. Questions about that? Does that seem straightforward? I think it's pretty straightforward. I, I don't know what you think. You guys are so excited today. I tell you what. You're all thinking about tonight. Thinking about uh, some basketball game going on tonight. I don't know what it is. Okay. Here's an example. Consider a firm just earned $4 a share. Just earned $4 a share. It has an ROE, return on equity, 12%. So estimate the growth in earnings assuming, one, assuming that all earnings are paid out as dividends. All earnings are paid out as dividends. Well, if all earnings are paid out as dividends, that's a 100% payout ratio, how much is retained? Everything's paid out as dividends, what's retained? Nothing, nothing's retained. So G equals ROE times retention, now just write retention, and that's going to equal 12% times zero, which is equal to zero. So the growth rate in this case is going to be zero. Nothing, I mean the earnings are not going to grow. Second case, no earnings paid out as dividends. Well, if no earnings are paid out as dividends, we have a 0% payout ratio, which means 100% is retained. So we have a 100% retention ratio. So G is going to equal ROE times retention. Equals 12% and I'm going to put the 100% as a decimal. So the growth rate will be 12%. So we, <clears throat> we see that uh, <coughs> if everything's paid out as dividends, we're going to get the benefit of all of that return on equity. So all of our earnings are going to be earn that 12% uh, return. OK, in this case, 40% of earnings paid out as dividends. So G here is going to be the return on equity, ROE, times retention, which is equal to ROE times 1 minus payout. So retention is just 1 minus the payout. So this is going to equal to 12% times 1 minus 0 0.4. 40% are paid out as, as uh, dividends. So that should equal something like 7.2% if I've done my math correctly. So 7.2%, we'd estimate that the growth in earnings for this firm that's paying 40% of its, its earnings out as dividends will be 7.2%. That's what we'd use for G. And this is a very common methodology in, in the dividend discount model framework for estimating what that growth rate in, in dividends will be. <coughs> Another model that's used is, is uh, basically just looking at the historic growth rate in dividends, just doing a time series analysis. How have dividends grown over time? And sometimes that's extrapolated forward uh, into the future. So that's another method that, that is used for dividends. Okay, so let's do a real world example. So let's consider Duke Energy. So the information we need, and we can get all this information from Yahoo, we need return on equity. It's out there in Yahoo. We need a payout ratio. It's out there in Yahoo. We need most recent dividend. It's out there in Yahoo. We need a beta. It's out there in Yahoo, and I'm going to 
explain what this adjusted beta is here in a second uh, and why we're doing that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and collect this data. So <clears throat> I'm going to slip into uh, uh, a browser and I'm going to go to Yahoo, finance.yahoo.com. Bless you. Here's finance.yahoo.com. Ticker symbol for Duke Energy is D-U-K. Yay! So here's Duke Energy. The information you need is going to be under statistics here. So all the information you need is going to be under statistics. Okay. Under statistics. Let's see. Uh, if we go down through here, we can... Uh, uh, first, we can pick out the beta. It's right there staring us in the face. And the beta here is... 0 0.09, which is very low. What's the, what's the average of all firms' betas? What's the average beta in the marketplace? I heard somebody say it. One. one. So the average beta in the marketplace, so the average firm in the marketplace has a beta of one. This beta is very low. I have, I'm, I'm viewing it skeptically. One of the things we know about betas is we... We estimate these betas with regression, so they're, they're actually measured with error. And what's been seen over time is they tend to regress back toward the mean. So if we get a beta that's really low, chances are we've underestimated what that beta is and that it's actually higher than that. If we estimate a beta that's really high, say 2.5, chances are we've overestimated that beta. And the true beta is something closer to 1. So we actually go through an adjustment process, and, and I have that adjustment process on the slide. But basically, we take, we take this beta as it is right now, multiply it by two-thirds, and then add another third to it. We'll go through the calculation here in a minute. But anyway, I'm writing down the beta on this, uh, <clears throat> this pulling it all together uh, slide, which we'll come back to. What else do we need from this? <clears throat> From this, we need return on equity. Let's scroll on down here, see what we find. Oh, there it is right there, return on equity, 6.38%. So there we have uh, the return on equity that we need. And scroll on down here. Over here we have information about splits and dividends, or dividends and splits. And so trailing annual dividend, this is the most recent annual dividend. So this would be our D0. So our D0, our trailing annual dividend is D0. $3.36. Oops, put in the wrong place. 336. And then look on down here a little bit further, we see a payout ratio. Payout ratio, 90.57%. Why do people like utility stocks? They like utility stocks because they pay lots of dividends. People buy utility stocks because they generate cash. Little old ladies buy utility stocks because they generate lots of cash. Okay, so <clears throat> payout ratio, 90.56%. Okay, so that's all the information we need from Yahoo to do this uh, valuation. So coming back to the PowerPoint slide, I've written down this information, some of it written in the wrong place, sorry. But. Okay, so return on equity, 6.38%.
payout ratio, 90.56%. Uh, most recent dividend, $3.36. Beta, 0 0.09. And this is the adjustment we're going to use for the beta. This is the adjustment we're going to use for the beta. One-third plus two-thirds times the beta that we take out of Yahoo. So it's going to be one-third plus two-thirds times 0 0.09. And so that's what we're going to use for that. And uh, <clears throat> somebody with a calculator is going to tell me what that is? I could use your help here. Point three nine. Zero point three nine. Okay, so there's our estimate of beta. That's what we're going to use in the capital asset pricing model. And so as long as we're at it, why don't we calculate R sub S? R sub S is equal to the risk free rate plus our beta times the risk premium on the market. So our risk-free rate is 2.4% plus our beta, 0.39, times the risk premium of 5%. And so what do we come up with there? <clears throat> All these quiz questions, exam questions that are embedded into these slides, geez, there's so many things to choose from. What's the uh, required rate of return for the stock for Duke Energy? What is it? 4.35%. Okay. 4.35%. Okay. We've got everything we need to estimate the value of Duke Energy. Okay, so let's see how this works out. So <clears throat> P0 should be equal to, if it's fairly priced, D0 times 1 plus G. Did we estimate G? We didn't estimate the growth rate, did we? Oh, we still have to estimate the growth rate. Oh, my goodness. G, how do we estimate G? G is equal to the return on equity, ROE, times 1 minus the payout, because that's what we got. And so that's equal to 6.38%. That's our return on equity. Times 1 minus our payout, 0 0.9056. 1 minus 0 0.9056. And so what do we have for a growth rate in dividends? <coughs> Point six. Point six o oh, two two. It's just just point six o oh, two, uh, and that's percent. Pretty small number, not very big. Is that right? Point six o. Oh, point six zero two. Six zero two. Okay. Point six zero. We'll do point six zero. That's close enough. Okay, so now we have everything we need to value this stock. So the dividend 
The most recent dividend was, I need to pull the slide out so I can see it. The most recent dividend was $3.36. times one plus the growth rate. So it's 0.6%, which is 1.006. Very small growth rate. Doesn't, it's not growing much at all. And we're going to divide that by R sub S minus G. We calculated R sub S as 0 0.0435. You've got to make sure you put it in as a decimal. Minus the growth rate, 0 0.006. P0 equals, so it's just a calculation now. Everybody come up with a number? Anybody come up with a number? Ninety. 0.137, so we'll just do uh, 0 0.14. $90.14, and this has actually changed since this morning because some, some number in there must have changed since this morning. But, <clears throat> so, there we go. We have an estimate for the intrinsic value using the dividend discount model. How long did it take us to do this? Well, 10 minutes, but... Obviously, I knew what we were doing ahead of time. So, so it, you'll, you'll struggle through this. Your biggest challenge is going to be finding the firm that you want to analyze. But anyway, how does this compare? How does this compare to uh, uh, the current market price? Current market price is 82.68. So we're we think that it uh, <clears throat> that the true value of the stock is you know a little bit more than the current market price. <clears throat> uh, it's not a lot more. I mean, well, it's it's maybe 12 percent higher or so, um, 10 to 12 percent higher, <clears throat> which isn't a big difference in stock valuation. So uh, you might make a recommendation at this point that you think that Duke Energy is going to outperform uh, given that you think it's worth $90 and it's currently priced at $82.68. So you may, you may give a slight buy recommendation for it. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I think we did a pretty good job of getting close to what the market value is. So, so that's the process you go through. Now, this, this company, and, and I, I, I didn't know it would work out this way ahead of time, this company worked out well because the growth rate we estimated was less than R sub S, was less than the required rate of return. If you come up with a growth rate that's greater than required rate of return, then you're going to have to use a multi-stage model, basically using high growth for a couple years and then, then assuming a lower long-term growth. So... <clears throat> Choose your, companies, uh, choose your companies wisely. I will look them over to give you approval to try to keep, try to make it easy and straightforward for you. So, anyway, questions? Okay. Okay, now there's another approach we can take to valuation called the corporate valuation model. In the corporate valuation model, we, we calculate the free cash flows coming from the firm. And free cash flows are the cash flows that after we have, after we've replaced equipment that's wearing out, after we have invested in growth for the future, 
after we have you know, invested in you know, increased needs for working capital, after we've done all of these investments here, the free cash flow is what's left over that we could pay out to investors and not hurt the prospects of the firm. So <clears throat> this EBIT minus one minus the tax uh, rate is the earnings, is basically the after-tax earnings before interest and in taxes. We add back air depreciation and amortization. And sometimes this is called EBITDA. You'll see it uh, written that way as EBITDA, <clears throat> which is earnings before interest and in taxes plus depreciation and amortization. So this depreciation and amortization reflects you know, <clears throat> uh, investment in, uh, in, in new plant equipment, this down here reflects investment and growth down here. And this is all cash that's left over that is available to the investors. And so we can value the firm. We're going to value the whole firm uh, based on these free cash flows. <coughs> so we, we find the value of the firm as a present value of all these free cash flows, and then we subtract off the value of the firm's debt and preferred stock because part of these free cash flows belong to the bondholders and, and preferred stockholders. Anything that's left over belongs to the common shareholders. So we have this total firm value, some of which we owe to the uh, bondholders and preferred stockholders. Anything remaining after that goes to the stockholders. <coughs> and so to find a value per share, we just take what, what belongs to the shareholders, divide by the number of shares outstanding, gives you uh, an intrinsic value for the stock. So that's the approach we use. We'll go through an example here in a minute. And this is often preferred, this corporate valuation model is, is often preferred to the dividend discount model because one, you may have a firm that doesn't pay any dividends, and so that, that presents a problem. How do you value a firm that doesn't pay dividends? Uh, secondly, in, in, in finance today, dividends are not the only way that cash is returned to shareholders. There's also something called a repurchase, which is like a dividend, but you don't see that when you open up uh, finance.yahoo.com and, and you look at you know, the statistics for your firm and it reports the dividends. It doesn't show you the repurchases. And so the dividend cash flow understates the cash that's actually coming back to those shareholders. <clears throat> so the, the corporate valuation model is the most preferred model for for doing the uh, uh, <clears throat> for doing a, a valuation of equity, and it's it's it it works pretty much the same way as the the dividend discount model, except instead of dividends, you have free cash flows. Instead of dividends, you have free cash flows. And <clears throat> typically, what we do is we forecast those free cash flows explicitly for a short time period, maybe three to five years. And then we assume that at some point in the future, these free cash flows will grow at a constant rate. A constant rate, G. Boy, I'm losing a lot of people today. Where's everybody going? I miss you. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I want to write them off, you know wasn't here at the end of class. Uh, and he was number three dropping out today, so he's not the first. <clears throat> so, no shame. I'll remember that. Just let him know that I will remember that. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> we're going we're gonna explicitly, to explicitly forecast the, uh, the uh, uh, free cash flows for like three to five years. And then we're going to determine some horizon value. So at the end of five years, all the cash flows beyond the end of five years have a, have a value. And we typically use a constant growth dividend discount or a constant growth model for valuing that. And there are other methods we can do also, but we're not going to get into the other methods. So here's an example. 
<clears throat> so we have a we have a uh, uh, a firm that has these forecast free cash flows for the next three years. So in year one, we forecast a free cash flow negative. So there's actually negative free cash flow, which is possible. I mean, that's, that's possible. You don't have negative dividends, but you can, could have negative free cash flow. <coughs> year two, we have a free cash flow of $10, $10 million. And then year three, we have a free cash flow of $20 million. We're saying that beyond year three, we don't really know what's going to happen. We're going to make the assumption that the free cash flows are going to grow forever at 5%. And typically what's assumed in these models is that we assume that the free cash flow will grow at something like the rate of GDP, the growth rate of GDP. That's a more typical assumption. But anyway, in this model, it's assumed that the free cash flows beyond year three are going to grow at 5%. And so these first three cash flows, we can value explicitly. No, cash flow number one, is minus five million dollars, it occurs at time one, we can discount that one, back one period at our required rate of return of 7%. So this minus 4.673 is just the present value of minus five million dollars that occurs a year from now. <clears throat> the 10 million dollar cash flow at time two, well we discount that back two periods at 8.734 or at 7% to give us 8.734 present value. Then the $20 million at time three, we discount back three periods. So it has a present value of $16.326 million. So we've explicitly valued these first three cash flows. Now the question is what do we do with all the cash flows? We know that free cash flows are gonna occur beyond time three. So how do we treat that? Well, what we have is we have a growing perpetuity. A growing perpetuity. So starting at time three, you think, think of this as, 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 as like the D0 on the dividend discount model. And so if we wanted to figure out what the value of all these cash flows beyond time three are, we just take <clears throat> this cash flow at time three, grow it at 5%. We grow that cash flow at 5%, at, at 5 we get $21 million. We calculate the value of that growing perpetuity, $20 million, or $21 million growing at 5% with a discount rate of 7%. So this is the constant growth model just applied to free cash flows in, instead of dividends. And that has a value, that cash flow stream has a value of $1 billion or $1 billion $50 million. But this, this value is at time three. This is what we call the horizon value. We call this the horizon value. This is what we think the firm is going to be worth at the end of time three. Horizon value. We think the firm is going to be worth one billion, fifty million dollars at the end of time three. Well, if you think it's going to be worth that much at the end of time three, what does that translate in today's dollars? So we take that one billion, fifty million dollars at time three, discount it back three periods to come up with the present value of that horizon value. So this is the present value of the horizon value of the firm. And so the, the total value of the firm today is just the sum of these first three free cash flows plus the horizon value for a total of $877.5 million. And so it's, it's, it's a very simple process. Just forecast out the free cash flows. Assume some constant growth rate beyond your uh, time three. Calculate that horizon value. Bring it all back to time zero. We got a value. 
This is the value of the firm. This is the value of the firm to all the investors, bondholders, preferred stockholders, and common stockholders. And so if we want to know what the value of the firm is to the common stockholders, then we have to account for the, uh, for the debt holders and the preferred stockholders. And so this firm has $40 million in total debt and preferred stock, so that's a given for us. And you could get this from a balance sheet. It has 10 million shares of common stock outstanding. You can get that from the balance sheet. And so the market value of the equity is just the market value of the firm. The market value of the firm, which we determined was $877.5 million, minus the market value of the debt and the preferred stock, which was $40 million. So the market value of the equity itself is just the difference. The market value of the equity is $837.5 million. That's all the equity. That, that total value is split across or shared over 10 million shares. So all we have to do is divide that by the number of shares outstanding and we come up with a per share value of 83.75. This method of valuation is the most common method for valuation of, of securities. It's, it's, it's used in, in mergers and acquisitions extensively. You don't have to worry about whether a company pays dividends or not. You don't have to worry about the preferred or, or, or stock uh, uh, buybacks that, that may be uh, spinning off cash to, to equity holders. So this is the most commonly used method for valuing valuing equity. <clears throat> but I'm not requiring you to do this in your stock valuation. You can try it if you want, but uh, uh, that's not a requirement. Another approach that's used is what's called the firm multiples approach. And basically, you, you, you did a ratio analysis, and in that ratio analysis you found like PE ratios for your industry uh, and, and common ratios, we look at uh, price to earnings, price to cash flow, price to sales. And so if we look at what these measures are for an industry, then we can use that, we can use that information to estimate what would be a fair price for our particular company. <coughs> Let's see, I don't think I have a, uh, oh, don't have that. So suppose, well, let's see what the, let's go back and look at this uh, Duke Energy. <clears throat> so the P ratio for Duke Energy is uh, <clears throat> 2650. And we'll use the, uh, the trailing PE for, <clears throat> for uh, actually, let's use a forward PE. Forward PE is looking at, at projected earnings in the future. So we'll use forward PE of 17.12. And if we look at competitors, uh, let's see, I don't think we can find competitors in here, but if we go to go to Morningside, I think we can find competitors in there and what the competitors ratios were. So let's check Morning, uh, Morningstar, I mean, not Morningside, Morningstar. And Duke, go directly to Morningstar. Duke. Ratios. No, I don't have the um, uh, don't have the competitors ratios right here. But let's suppose 
Let's suppose we have an industry ratio Eighteen point five. So, coming back to <clears throat> Duke Energy, if we look at uh, <clears throat> another thing you want to, might want to look at is analyst forecast. Analyst forecast of what uh, earnings are going to be next year. So, uh, revenue estimates. Let's see, earnings estimates. Here's the earnings estimate. Uh, <clears throat> number of analysts. Then this is for next year. Average, aver, average analyst estimate for earnings next year, $4.83. So this is the earnings per share that analysts are forecasting a, an earnings per share next year of $4.83. So I'm going to write that down on this sheet of paper, then, then I'm going to talk about these. <clears throat> Duke's EPS forecast. And this will be our last slide today, so don't abandon me yet. 483. Don't abandon me yet. Last slide. Okay. No escaping. I'm going to lock the doors from now on. Okay, so, so we see the Duke Energy's uh, P-E ratio is 17.12. And I just uh, suppose the industry ratio is 18.5. So the, the P ratio for the rest of the industry is 18.5 uh, times. And if we say, okay, well, suppose Duke Energy becomes more like the industry. Well, we could, we could based, on, based on the industry uh, PE, A fair price or a fair price for Duke will equal this, this industry PE ratio here, 18.5 times the earnings forecast for Duke, 4.83. So if we think that, that you know, Duke should have a, a, a PE ratio more like the industry, right there, and we're forecasting earnings, earnings per share of, of $4.83 for this next year, what price does that imply? What price does that imply? And so somebody with a calculator could tell me what that is. $89.36. So $89.36. So this is another method for coming up with a price estimate. We use these multiples. Most commonly used is the P-E ratio. And there are some other ratios that are used along with that uh, uh, free cash flow model, but uh, I won't get into those <clears throat> because they're really beyond the scope of this class. So if you do a simple P-E ratio, you could do a, a price to cash flow ratio, price to sales ratio, Select some of the competitors for your company. Just pull those, those numbers out of uh, finance.yahoo and do an average across your competitors to come up with an estimate of what the industry ratio is. Uh, that would be a good, uh, a good method for estimating this. So <clears throat> it, it doesn't take a lot of time. It's just you know, a little tedious stuff to pull out this information. Okay, there are a couple more slides here which I'm not going to cover. I'm not going to do the EVA. I'm not going to cover the uh, uh, preferred stock because preferred stocks are like bonds. They pay a regular dividend. You treat them as a perpetuity. Now, there's really nothing to valuing preferred stocks. So, anyway, so that's all I'm going to do today. <clears throat>